first. A warm welcome to all of you attending our 21st annual Ruskin Lecture. We'd hope that this important lecture would be an in-person event at the Doheny Library at USC, but COVID once more intervened. So we shall make the best of it and appreciate our lecturer, Professor Johansson's patience with all the rearrangements. I'd like to turn the program over to our executive director, Gabe Meyer, to introduce Dr. Johansson. Thank you, Eric. We um, started these annual Ruskin lectures um, more than 20 years ago with a definite mission, with a definite purpose. And we wanted these annual talks to engage a contemporary issue, an issue of concern to us now, through the lens of British art and social critic John Ruskin's thought and see what would happen. What insights, shifts of perspective, new questions and subversive enrichments would arise out of this reflection. And I'm happy to report they always have. And so in the, rec in the recent past, we've had lectures on language, market-driven education, Ruskin's truths in an age of fake news and so forth. Um, we've e even come up with a name for this approach, Applied Ruskin. Ruskin not seen merely as a 19th century sage, an historical figure, but as a resource for us in the 21st century. As Tim Berenger at Yale uh, likes to say, Ruskin is bigger than Ruskin. Tonight promises to be a particularly important and timely and dare I say, challenging exercise in applied Ruskin. In the face of ecological crisis, Ruskin's vision of the sufficient life. I'm gonna quote from Ruskin's Modern Painters Five, the fifth volume of his great masterwork, Modern Painters, which he published in 1860. He writes, so the things to be desired for man in a healthy state are that he should not see dreams, but realities that he should not destroy life, but save it. And that he should not be rich, but content. I met our speaker, Frederick Alberton Johnson in early 2020 at a conference on Ruskin and the Anthropocene. Uh, Frederick will explain what that means. Uh, at Notre Dame University on the very the very last weekend before COVID took hold of our lives in February, the end of February, 2020. I believe Amy Woodson Bolton is coming on tonight and she also spoke at that conference and Robert Goulding is with us, uh, one of the organizers of that Notre Dame conference. Um, I've been, uh, I was particularly impressed with Frederick's presentation We've been corresponding ever since, and I, and I was particularly uh, struck with Frederick and his wife Vicky's study, The Green Victorians, The Simple Life in Ruskin's Lake District, published in 2016 by the University of Chicago Press. We'll give you a link to that uh, later on. And the book's exploration of the lives of Ruskin's associates in the Lake District as they attempted to imagine new ways of life built on sufficiency rather than consumerist acquisition as personal and cultural expressions of ecological responsibility. So we're so pleased after all this that Delta strains and COVID restrictions notwithstanding that Frederick can be with us. Frederick Alberton Johnson is a historian of energy, environment, and intellectual history at the University of Chicago. Originally from Stockholm, Sweden, he now lives on the edge of the Indiana Dunes National Park outside Chicago. Most of his books and essays focus on two closely related questions. How did fossil fuel 
come to dominate modern society? And what might the past teach us about finding a different way of flourishing in the world? He's currently finishing a book with Carl Venerlin entitled Scarcity, Economy and Nature in the Age of Capitalism, which will be out uh, next year. Without further ado, Frederick Alberton Johnson. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Gabe. Um, and thank you to uh, the entire Rescue North Club for inviting me and, and joining us here tonight. Um, I'm afraid it's getting on in, uh, in Indiana. It's, uh, you're you're going to see dusk fall behind me. Uh, uh, but um, I'll try to stay awake and, and keep this as enjoyable as I can. Um, I have a, a relatively short talk to give, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some, some interesting Q&A about, about the paper and other related things. Um, as I was listening to you, Gabe, I, it suddenly occurred to me that uh, 25 years to the day, I had gone up with a few friends from Cambridge. I was on in the MPhil track there, uh, working on the history of political thought. And um, we, uh, we decided to get away for a weekend. We, we rented a, a two rooms in a cottage uh, and it happened to be down the road from Brantwood. Um, I'd heard of Ruskin, but I'd never been to, to Brantwood at that point. Um, and we, we sort of blissfully unaware walked up the hill <laughs> and were thunderstruck by the vision of Brantwood. Uh, and then it had been raining, uh, but suddenly the sky opened across the old man and we saw the view that Ruskin loved so much. Um, and uh, it would be several more years before I started uh, doing work on, on Ruskin, but um, that vision stayed with me and uh, to this day. Um, um, and that's very much what fires my, my, uh, my scholarship. Uh, the sense that Brantwood is, uh, dare I say it, a magical place, um, a gateway to a different world, perhaps. Um, so in that spirit, um, I'll, talk about, I'll talk about Ruskin and Brantwood, and I'll also talk about the rather um, distressing situation we all find ourselves in at this moment. Um, let me see if I can share screen here. Um, and also I want to thank Joseph Rodriguez for helping me um, figuring things out beforehand. Let's see if, um, if I can get the PowerPoint slides to work. Uh, I hope you can all see the slide. It's supposed to show you planetary boundaries. Yep, looks good, wonderful. Okay, well, here goes. Um, and thanks again for listening. Um, we live in a moment of planetary crisis. The global expansion of consumer society has produced worldwide ecological strains from climate change to the threat of biodiversity depletion and uh, most unpleasantly, a greater frequency of epidemics, pandemics from land use change of which COVID-19 is a really nasty specimen. This crisis point though is also a clarifying moment in the, history of the, in the history of humanity um, and capitalism. Simply put, we're beginning to see the limits of the prevailing growth model. American standards of affluence cannot be universalized without dangerous environmental pressure on the planet. We simply cannot grow our way out of this crisis. Technical fixes will not suffice, although technology is much needed. I'm not, I'm not a Luddite, um, but technical fixes alone are not enough. A long-term remedy, I think, has to be found in cultural change, in a profound political and cultural transformation. So that's really my subject today. Um, I'll try to explain why I think Ruskin should be one of the guides to this cultural transformation. Simply put, we need to overcome the cornucopian idea of insatiability that permeates our fossil fuel economy. So the great enemy is insatiability. And Ruskin knew this very well. My talk will explore an alternative way of being in the world invented more than 150 years ago by John Ruskin, the art critic and utopian. 
Ruskin, I argue, was at the forefront of a movement that sought to reorient the imagination away from the marketplace towards the world of art, nature, and community. Above all, he was interested in the theory and practice of what I call sufficiency, the art of living well within modest material needs outside the realm of mass consumerism. I'll spend the first talk of this, the first half of this talk, um, detailing what I mean by sufficiency and, and showing me some images from Ruskin to go along with that idea. Uh, and then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to pivot out and approach the present and um, explain a little bit about what we mean by planetary boundaries and the Anthropocene um, and the kind of conceptual framework that explains why indeed we are in a planetary crisis. And then I'll come back full circle to Ruskin at the end and give you um, a list of reasons, I think, why Ruskin uh, really ought to be our guide. So uh, let's begin with Ruskin's vision. The lovely image I found in the Ruskin Center online archive uh, just yesterday, uh, obviously from one of his Venice trips. It doesn't have a date, um, but it's identified as an uh, image of sailing boats in Venice. What's the meaning of the ship to Ruskin? Well, uh, there's a great deal to it. For Ruskin, the purpose of the economy, of the human economy, was to provide for the satisfaction of basic needs guided by a principle of self-restraint. Rather than imagining the economy as an endless frontier, always expanding outward, Ruskin thought of it as a bounded space. And here he was leaning on ancient and medieval philosophy. Um, to imagine a bounded space organized hierarchically, often in the form of a household, but also sometimes as a ship. The ancient philosopher Xenophon compared the economy of his own time, or the Greek economy, to a Phoenician merchant ship, a Phoenician merchant ship. Everything on board this vessel, he said, had to be precisely stored and stowed within the compact space inside the hull all the necessary tools and food and, and merchant goods were arranged so carefully that everything was always quite at hand. The captain and crew must exercise constant discipline to make provisions last on the voyage. Now, Ruskin's ship economy was not just reinventing ancient philosophy, I would argue, but also anticipating the ecological thought of the late 20th and early 21st century. Writing almost exactly 100 years after Ruskin, the British economist Kenneth Boulding compared the economy of planet Earth to a spaceship in transit between the stars. While space travel usually implies transcendence and freedom from the Earth, for Boulding, the actual practice of space travel was necessarily and obviously ecological. On long journeys between the stars, everything on board must center on the practical problem of preserving life within a closed space over many generations, maintaining and repairing a self-sustaining economy on a small scale with limited stock carried along. Bolding imagined the closed system of the spaceship model in terms of a cyclical economy where all materials were recovered. The aim was to minimize what the economists or the ecologists might call throughput, throughput while maintaining stock. There were no mines and no sewers in a spaceship. Everything had to be recycled. Now, fast forward to the present and um, the Californian science fiction author, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, turned Boulding's lovely metaphor into a riveting ecological uh, spaceship novel, um, which begins with a failure to colonize a nearby uh, solar system and centers on the action of returning back to home. And that takes enormous effort um, just to make the ecosystems on board survive the long journey. Right? I think um, Kim Stanley Robinson's fable 
of space travel going home is capturing something essential, not just about Bolden's e ecological economics, but also Ruskin's earlier economy of nature. And um, a quote here from, from, as you see, from Robinson here, um, from uh, the, the novel Aurora, you're tied in a knot you can never undo when you realize Earth is a starship too, right? And I remind you of the spiral pattern that occurs, recurs in, in Ruskin's imagery. The other cornerstone of Ruskin's idea of sufficiency, besides the closed economy, the spaceship economy or the ship economy, is his definition of consumption. For Ruskin, all commercial exchange had moral meaning. In every market transaction, the consumer should always consider how the purchase might affect the worker. This required an understanding of the conditions of production and also uh, the work of nature in making things useful and beautiful for humans. The producers in turn ought to limit their production only to those things that were genuinely useful and wanted by the consumer. In this way, Ruskin rejected the conventional idea of market exchange in which mass production of cheap goods fueled endless demand insatiable humans. For Ruskin, true value was measured by durable handmade goods instead of mass produced and disposable commodities. The intrinsic value of a thing depended on its power to support life. Ruskin meant this both in the biological sense and also in the, in the higher spiritual or psychological sense. He said, a sheaf of wheat has in it measurable power of sustaining the substance of the body a cubic foot of pure air, a fixed power of sustaining its warmth, and a cluster of flowers of given beauty, a, a, a fixed power of animating the senses and heart. Right. Um, this is from the Ashmolean Museum. Um, it's, it's from um, the elements of drawing that Ruskin put together. Um, what a lovely specimen this is. You can see exactly what he's thinking about here, I think. Um, uh, both nutrition but also in itself an object of astonishing beauty. Ruskin's work as an artist and amateur naturalist profoundly shaped his understanding of consumption and the good life. To consume was not, was not just a way of recognizing the work, the skilled work of the other, but also a way of seeing the utility and beauty of the natural world. Ethical consumption and production brought humans more fully into the web of life. Ruskin recognized that most kinds of consumption did not follow his principle. He put it, three fourths of the demand existing in the world is romantic, founded on visions, idealism, hopes, and affections. The regulation of the purse is in its essence regulation of the imagination. So from that follow that proper consumption required an education of desire an education of desire. People must be taught not to want useless, wasteful things. For Ruskin, and this is really crucial, this was not a turn, a negative turn to austerity and asceticism of renunciation, but rather a process that made possible new, higher kinds of flourishing, right? We think, of, we think of environmentalism in the sort of stereotypical sense we think it means having less. Well, Ruskin would have said, no, 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 you're getting it backwards. You'll actually have more if you follow my path. You'll be richer. And here's that lovely view from, from Brantwood looking across Coniston Water to, to the village and the old man, the mountain um, across from Brantwood, from Ruskin's home. But Ruskin sufficiency was always a practical aim, never just a theoretical conceit. In midlife, he moved from London to this new home, Brantwood in the Lake District. There, he used his considerable fortune to set in motion a series of concrete projects. 
supporting arts and crafts, locally handicrafts, elementary education, and also turning his own home into a laboratory for sufficient living. These projects attracted a great deal of support among locals as well as uh, friends from around England and beyond. Uh, when Ruskin's faltering mental health made it increasingly difficult for him to take part in community action, his friends and supporters carried on the work in a number of directions. So that's really what um, my book, the book I wrote with my wife, Vicky, is all about. It, it begins with Ruskin, but it's really about a few of these followers and their lives in the Lake District. So you can think of uh, this arts and crafts community uh, surviving really until the Great War. Now, Ruskin's critique of consumer society was married to a defense of peasant tradition. Wise consumption meant living within one's means and finding satisfaction with one's social station, right? So there's a conservative strain to Ruskin's thought. Uh, he's imagining the ethics of consumption as a way of preserving what he thought of as the peasant stock, the pure peasant stock of the Lake District. Sometimes he talks about this even in racial terms, right? So the ethics of consumption for him has a certain paternalist political slant. It's, if you like, it's about a two-tier society of lords and, and peasants. Um, I don't think we have to buy, we have to take on board this conservative view of poverty and peasantry in Ruskin uh, to embrace his critique of mass consumption. I think we can, we can uh, adopt his idea of sufficiency for our own time and for a more democratic age. Um, and I think you can, we can do that by uh, agreeing that sufficiency ought to be the universal basis of human flourishing, right? Not some kind of double standard where the poor live more different lives than the rich, but rather a universal standard for all not just within the nation, but also globally, right? Um, so that creates a very different problem from Ruskin's. Ruskin was, in one sense, he was trying to create a, a reservation, a kind of preserve for peasants and the nature they lived in, in the Lake District. And, and as you, many of you know, um, the National Trust in part is indebted to Ruskin as a project, right? Um, but what I'm hinting at is a very different political project than that, not a preserving peasants in the land, but rather to find a path of convergence where rich and poor arrive at a similar standard of flourishing. More about that in a moment. Now, uh, this is an image drawn by Ruskin's secretary, William Collingwood, in the fall of 1882, um, as you see it called uh, Lake Geneva under the smoke cloud. And Ruskin scholars have long thought of his talk of storm clouds and smoke clouds as um, possibly expressions of his uh, mental debility and possibly theological talk. Um, I argue in, in uh, the book I wrote with Vicky uh, that we should take Ruskin's idea of climate change in the 19th century quite seriously. He really believed that the world was altering fundamentally. Uh, and this motivated his experiment in sufficiency. By the 1870s, Ruskin became convinced that Europe's climate was deteriorating and that the root of these changes uh, must be anthropogenic. Human waste and pollution were destroying the web of life. This is what Ruskin called the storm cloud of the 19th century. Although these changes were most apparent in Europe, Ruskin already in 1871 predicted that they would soon envelop the entire world, right? So Ruskin, in fact, if I'm right, uh, was a planetary thinker. So again, a reason to listen carefully to Ruskin in our own planetary crisis. Ruskin's warning of climate change in 1870 was, of course, uh, quite precocious. Uh, yet now we seem to have entered fully into the nightmare vision of the storm cloud. Our planet is changing 
into a strange and unstable new environment. And those of you who live in California know this all too well. My wife is Californian, so I, I feel I have, I now have deep roots in that state myself, and I mourn for what is happening. Um, the fossil fuels that once promised mastery over nature have turned out to be tools of destruction, disturbing the basic biogeochemical processes that make our world habitable. Even the recent past is no longer what we thought it was. Earth system scientists and geologists now say that the entire period after World War II forms the threshold to a new geological epoch, which they call the Anthropocene. But now I'm going to pivot away from Ruskin for a little bit and talk about some of you will know uh, about these ideas uh, in some detail. But uh, for those of you who are new to this, I thought I would just give you a sketch of what the Anthropocene uh, is meant to signify. So the concept of the Anthropocene was coined recently in the year 2000 by the chemist Paul Crutzen and his colleague Eugene Stormer to draw attention to a rupture in human history and the history of the planet. Fossil fuel emissions from the rich economy have disrupted the relative stability of the Holocene climate. The impact of economic growth on ecosystems around the world is so great that humanity has now become a geological force. One way to think about that is we now act um, almost like those asteroids that appeared in the, in the geological past, causing mass extinction. We are, we are uh, very quickly uh, in geological time, and rather slowly in human terms, uh, materializing as a geological force. One way to think about this is simply to track carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere from the Pleistocene through the Holocene era and into the modern period. And you see a clear break right around the moment that Ruskin was envisioning the storm cloud. It's quite eerie. Um, we transcended the Holocene pattern of natural variability of carbon dioxide around 1875. Now, why does this matter? It matters in great part because most of the history of mankind in complex sedentary societies uh, is uh, a manifestation of Holocene stability, right? Um, agriculture, civilization in our sense, um, again, complex societies with a division of labor, with, with states, with writing and art, all of the things we associate with civilization only come to be in the Holocene. And that is a period of almost unique climatological stability. Um, we are in danger of undoing that stability and ending up in a situation that might resemble in some sense the Pleistocene, um, where humans were very few and sometimes faced near extinction events. So, um, as, as if climate change wasn't bad enough news, um, it's not enough um, to simply focus on climate change, even though it's without a doubt the greatest of the threats we face. Uh, scientists around the world have come together to uh, conceive of a series of quantitative boundaries or, or zones of risk. Um, that humans are in danger um, of transgressing. Um, when, if, and when we transgress, um, we are on a fast track to triggering um, tipping points, uh, nonlinear change in the Earth system of various kinds. Um, so, so in this uh, updated version of the planetary boundaries model, you see that we're dealing with, um, you can think of the green zone as, as the zone of the Holocene, of stability, of, of natural abundance. Um, you can think of the yellow as a warning that we're on the wrong path, and the red as a clear sign that we're approaching a tipping point. 
Um, so as you see, climate change here is but one facet in, in, in a much greater interconnected series of challenges, including uh, chemical pollution, acidification, uh, nitrogen flux, um, and, and so forth. Uh, we can come back to, to the details of this at the end if, if you want to hear more. Um, um, the point I'm trying to make is that since World War II, we have rapidly begun to move out of this Holocene uh, zone of stability, relative stability, towards uh, a much more dangerous threshold to tipping points. Um, and the same group that, that conceived of the planetary boundaries model have also tried to theorize or quantify uh, uh, the changes, both socioeconomic and environmental since 1945, 1950. And so you see on the left-hand side, some indicators uh, for socioeconomic trends. Um, as you see, they're all, they all are characterized by exponential growth. Uh, and we used to think that was a very good thing, right? Um, post-war America, post-war capitalism was supposed to be the land of cornucopia. The problem here is that um, on the right-hand side, um, these earth system scientists are also tracking uh, uh, alarming trends in, in the earth system. Uh, again, these are, uh, these are a select number of possible uh, metrics to follow. Um, um, but you see that the point of this is to say that precisely the moment of uh, acceleration of growth after 1945-1950 is also the moment of impending environmental crisis. Right? And it's, it's now, th these trends have been in motion now for two generations, now uh, we're beginning to see the effects in full, right? So that's, a, that's another way of thinking about the Anthropocene, that the entire landscape of, your, of our youth, of whether you were born in 1950 or, or um, in 1972, like myself, was already marked by this great transition. We are all children of the Anthropocene. Okay, so the great acceleration probably can't go on for much longer. That's one simple meaning of the term. Um, uh, but um, it also raises questions about causation. Uh, how did this happen and when? I think it's a big mistake to begin the story in 1945 or 1950 um, and simply assume that something about post-war society created these trends. That's uh, not right. Um, I specialize in the early modern antecedents of the Great Acceleration. I studied the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century. I study empire and slavery. Uh, and I also study the intellectual history of the idea of growth. Um, what's so interesting is uh, that in some sense, I'll skip over this slide. In some sense, the Great Acceleration begins in the 17th and 18th centuries. It begins with a new worldview. Um, it begins with the idea that the human mind has insatiable desires um, that can drive the economy. And it begins also with a parallel uh, idea that humans can master the natural world, that the natural world is a machine that can be known and controlled. Right? So mechanistic natural philosophy, together with a new psychology of insatiable desire, I would say is the ultimate intellectual cause of the great acceleration. Now, that's exactly what Ruskin was worried about in his own moment in the late 19th century. He was fighting this cornucopianism. Of course, he wouldn't live to see the great acceleration. But around him are already signs of, if you like, uh, a little acceleration, the second industrial revolution. So um, this, by the way, if, if you don't know this painting, this is one of the most magnificent paintings of, of, the, uh, of the European Enlightenment. It's, uh, 
Uh, it's by Joseph Wright of Darby, of course. Um, and it shows us uh, the character of the philosopher explaining the motion of the planets in the solar system. And you see uh, there's a candle hidden away by the silhouette, right, to signify the sun. And then mecha in mechanical motion all around uh, the, uh, the planets orbiting the sun, right? So it's an image of the triumph of human intelligence in making uh, intelligible uh, the solar system. To, to all and everyone. It's just, it's so fascinating to look, to, to study the faces uh, uh, and see all the, all the ideas and sentiments of the enlightenment personified here. Again, we can come back to this uh, in the Q and A if you're interested. Um, but now on to, on to uh, the last part of this uh, planetary crisis uh, section of the lecture. Um, uh, some of you may remember this moment um, Jim Hansen of NASA went up to Congress in uh, the hot summer of 1988 to give testimony to the greenhouse effect. Um, and um, this resulted in basically a bi bipartisan agreement that climate change, in, climate change in fact was, if not a clear present danger, at least uh, an obvious threat. Um, that the public and politicians ought to uh, think about. Um, so 1988, um, we often think of as the moment when climate change became a political reality recognized by the public, um, at least in North America. You can have a slightly different date um, for other countries, but somewhere around there. It's also the moment of the founding of the IPCC. Um, so environmental consciousness of the great acceleration as a bad thing, as a dangerous thing, you could say, of course, had been stirring with Rachel Carson's and Carson and others in the 1960s, but it's really after 1988 that uh, this sense of humanity as a geological agent capable of disrupting the climate is beginning to enter into public conversation as a threat. Um, obviously, it's been slow going after this, um, and we're still in some ways treading water um, in making real, uh, real policy that takes climate change seriously. Um, um, more, more of that in a moment. Um, um, I like to call this hesitancy or this, this um, inertia in politics and climate change politics uh, a kind of hangover. I call it the Holocene hangover, right? So we are, we've entered into the Anthropocene, formally the geologists say, but we still live and act under the shadow of the cornucopianism that uh, shaped modernity in its first phase. So we are sort of, we're caught in between two worlds. One of the most interesting voices to speak of uh, uh, the Anthropocene and climate change in recent years is the Indian uh, novelist Amitabh Ghosh, who wrote a brilliant essay called The Great Derangement um, a few years back, um, actually based on lectures he gave at the University of Chicago, I think in 2015 or maybe 16. Um, Ghosh, speaks of the great acceleration from the point of view of South Asia. Um, uh, for him, the South Asian perspective is a bitter one. The entry of India and China into the great acceleration drives home um, an awful truth about the project of the modern economy. Uh, Amitav Ghosh says, as a late comer on the stage, Asia has unwittingly stumbled upon the secret that is the key to the plot. By driving up worldwide demand for energy and resources, while at the same time increasing the amount of waste and pollution in the Earth system, Asian growth is pushing the economy closer to the critical boundaries that must be maintained in order to keep the planet habitable. Right? So the more you try to universalize the American project of growth, uh, the more pressure you put on the Earth system. The lesson in Gosha's mind is revelatory. Gosha insists the patterns of life 
that modernity engenders can only be practiced by a small minority of the world's population. The promise of the great acceleration to the world cannot be universalized. Okay, so this is quite dire. What do we do? Well, underway is a critical response that follows Gauche and others um, in reimagining the economy. Perhaps our best option is to seek convergence around a universal model of human flourishing based on a mixture of socioeconomic and ecological standards for everyone. Kate Rayworth, the British economist, uh, conceptualizes this set of standards in what she calls donut economics, uh, right? So she's, she's using the, the metrics from the planetary boundaries model we saw in, uh, a moment ago, but she's adding to that uh, a set of minimum standards for uh, the social and economic welfare of the population. So the trick is to reach those standards, those socioeconomic standards, without transgressing the planetary boundaries that lie beyond them, right? So the green, the donut, um, is the, the zone of just and safe development for Kate Rayworth. Uh, politically, this is not gonna be easy, obviously. How do we come to an agreement to converge on just development for all. Um, we'd have to balance the right to development in the global south against the already overshooting economies of the north. Well, I'm not going to propose any remedies or direct lessons here, that's not my role. Um, what I will do, how, well, I, I'll finish this talk uh, by suggesting that there are plenty of really wonderful and interesting thinkers engaged with this problem already. Um, uh, they include, among others, Pope Francis, uh, who in his encyclical Laudato Si, launched a devastating critique of modern consumerism. Um, in the name of St. Francis Assisi. Uh, they also include the American environmentalist Bill McKibben, who may be familiar to some of you as the founder of the 350 movement. Uh, McKibben doesn't look to Catholic tradition, he looks to American tradition, particularly American Romanticism, Thoreau, Emerson, and the founding fathers. Um, and on the, on the left, on the secular left, um, we have a whole new generation of scholars and activists who look to Marx and the socialist tradition uh, for a deeper understanding of the origins of climate change um, and the system change they think is necessary. So this is where I want to, where I want to end. Um, we, uh, we seem to have St. Francis of Assisi, Thoreau and Marx, uh, involved in a reimagining of the economy. Why do we need to add Ruskin to that mix? <laughs> what, what is it that Ruskin gives us that those others cannot? Uh, well, first of all, Ruskin helps us see what is wrong with the idea of insatiable desire in the service of infinite economic growth. He is, as I would call him, a finitarian, not a cornucopian someone who's comfortable thinking about limits. Second, Ruskin encourages us to take consumption seriously, not simply as an individual act of conscience, but a force, a social popular force that shapes communities from the local scale on. That's, I think, the meaning of his experiments in the Lake District, uh, preserving and strengthening the social bonds of a community through new shared norms. Third, Ruskin imagines sufficiency not as an ascetic act of enunciation, but rather as an alternative hedonism, which will enrich and enhance 
the pleasures and beauty of life, right? So again, not some sort of monkish rejection of the world, but rather a way home, a way to appreciate the world in its full beauty. Right? Mass consumerism in this vision is just a sterile uh, uh, distraction from what's, what's real and valuable in life. This is a vital argument also for tactical or strategic reasons, I think, because I don't think we can ever overcome the force of modern consumerism simply by asking people to behave like monks. Discipline and renunciation will never do the trick. Um, interestingly, I'm joined in this view by uh, the Marxist philosopher, Kate Soper, who just published uh, a book called Post-Growth Living, where she makes precisely this argument from a Marxist perspective, although without ever, ever mentioning Ruskin. Right? Um, but there's some tension there. Now, fourth, and I have two more points and then I'm done. Fourth, Ruskin insists that consumption reflects the web of life. To appreciate the true value of things, one has to know something about natural history, about chemistry, and even geology. Mass consumption occurs in a knowledge vacuum without any genuine appreciation of the structures of human labor or the environmental processes that make the world around us. Ruskin wants us to see the world reflected in each object. A well-made thing connects us with the workers as well as the work of nature. Final point, the fifth point. Ruskin reorients society towards repair and restoration. Everywhere he looked, he saw evidence of industrial forces tearing at the fabric of life, polluting the land and the air. As we heard, he even developed a precocious sense of climate change and planetary fragility in the 1870s, long before the rise of our own climate crisis. I think this ethos of repair may just be uh, the critical value to reorient our economy. Slowing down the great acceleration will require immense effort and creativity in cultural and technical terms. We have to find a way to repair what we've damaged. Fossil fuel economies must transition to renewable energy while at the same time removing carbon from the atmosphere. We also need to make room for biodiversity by halting land use change and setting aside sufficient space where non-human life forms may thrive. E.O. Wilson, the Harvard evolutionary biologist, provocatively computes, calculates that we need to set aside approximately half of the Earth's land mass to avoid a mass extinction. Our best bet in this great work of repair is to exercise the cornucopianism of fossil fuel modernity and reorient our culture and our way of life towards a new economics and politics of repair oriented towards the goal of universal flourishing within planetary boundaries. In this regard, I suspect Ruskin will make an even better ally than St. Francis or St. Marx. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, I wonder if you would say a little bit about some of Ruskin's associates in the Lake District, just a little bit of a flavor of the kinds of things that they were doing in an early response to these impulses from Ruskin. Mm -hmm. um, we focused our book on uh, a set of characters, um, including a, a, a Victorian an elderly spinster who was one of Ruskin's best friends, Susie Beaver, um, who uh, he turned to for advice on all things horticultural. She's quite a remarkable figure. She forms the subject of the second chapter of, of the book, Green Victorians. Um, and then we have a case study of uh, another character around in, in Ruskin's set named uh, Hardwick Ronsley, who was a vicar 
an Anglican vicar um, who married uh, a conservative sense of Christianity with support of the arts and crafts movement. Um, the third cast of characters is a whole family, uh, the Collingwood family. Uh, William Collingwood, William Gershom Collingwood was the uh, private secretary who drew that wonderful um, depiction of the storm cloud. Um, also, of course, uh, Ruskin's earliest biographers, a truly devoted disciple of Ruskin, who encouraged his whole family, his wife Edith and his children, uh, to live a Ruskinian life. So um, we have two chapters actually in the book, Green Victorians, that follow, um, uh, that follow the calling was around and show uh, what a Ruskinian childhood would have been like in, um, in the 1890s. Um, you know, I haven't talked much about education, but that obviously looms very large on the agenda. Um, uh, so so uh, that's, the, that's really the centerpiece, this question of um, how, to how to grow up Ruskinian uh, is the centerpiece, the centerpiece case study of Green Victorians. We also have other uh, characters come in and out of the action, um, including this uh, London barrister, uh, Fleming, Albert Fleming, who revived handicrafts in the Lake District. Uh, and uh, you may know the, uh, the British uh, children's author, Arthur Ransom, who wrote um, these, uh, the books called Swallows and Amazons, which are the, the first set of them are set in the Lake District. Uh, Ransom was uh, practically the adopted son of the Collingwoods. So there's an echo of Swallows and Amazons, uh, of, of the Ruskinian principles in his book series, Swallows and Amazons. So in some sense, even if you've never heard of Ruskin, you never know, knew anything about Collingwood, if you've read Ransom, you have, a, you have a faint echo of those ideas. You had mentioned in the end of your, of your book, Green Victorians, that Ruskin's followers constitute both an inspiration and a warning. If you we could elaborate a little bit on that, that would be great. Yeah, um, well, it, partly this, is um, in reference to the paternalism that I, that I spoke of earlier. And I think there are, there are uh, different currents and strands in, uh, in the arts and crafts movement. Some of them are progressive and, and uh, democratic um, and wedded to uh, anti-racism, to everything I hold dear. Um, but unfortunately, there are also other more reactionary strands. Uh, so one way to think about this project, as I, as I hinted at earlier, is that um, Ruskin and some of his followers, especially Hardwick, thought of arts and crafts as a way to preserve um, a very pure uh, race of peasants um, in um, a hollowed landscape. Right, so they were interested in preserving the landscape itself, but they also figured that you had to have the people in there to cultivate it. Right, so it is in some sense a moral, uh, an idea of a moral preservation that, that they're pushing for. Ruskin maybe less so, you see it most clearly in, in Ronsley, I think, yeah. Um, another way of putting, it, of putting the problem though is, is that Ruskin isn't ever particularly interested in politics and the role of the state, um, at least not in this period. Uh, so it, it's, it's not always clear how one can translate his universal principles into practical action, right? Um, and I think that's a, that is a grave deficit. Uh, and that is a deficit he shares with some of his followers because it, it can lead you to embrace the status quo, to, to single out some, some landscape, some region where you see virtue still flourishing uh, and to seek to protect that, but to leave everything else behind, right? So it leads, despite all the talk about universalism, it can lead you to a certain kind of separatism 
I find that very troubling. Comment from someone else? I've got a question. Hi, Frederick. Um, I wish we could have done this in person at USC, but um, you know this this will have to do. And it's lovely to hear your talk. Um, I've got two questions, but I'm I'm going to do one now, and maybe we can come back to the second one a little bit later. Uh, so Ruskin was obviously clinically depressed or mentally unwell. I don't know. However, you want to say it in his later decades, and his friend Susie Beaver seemed to indicate that his despair could have been um, uh, aggravated or caused by his reaction to seeing all the pollution and climate change that, that he was seeing and, and that he thought humans were to blame for. So as, as I see those curves that you just showed us, you know, it really looks like humanity is running right off the edge of a cliff and it's, it's hard not to feel depressed about that mm -hmm. um, and just about the fate of our planet when, when you see that. Um, especially because it's going to take the whole world acting together to try to fix this problem. And our track record on universal collaboration is not good historically. So beyond, say, recycling and composting and ditching our internal combustion engines as soon as we can, mm -hmm. do you have any other suggestions uh, that we can do? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you so much, Tyson, for that. Of, of course, you're right. It's, it is easy to succumb to despair in the face of what the scientists are saying. I mean, the project with Ruskin was frankly therapeutic for me and, and for Vicky to, to engage in, in something that, that you know, felt like a constructive approach to uh, our own sense of despair. Um, now, uh, you're asking in some sense about the future. What, what can we do now and in, in the coming years? Um, I think, you know, I don't expect the divisions of the world to vanish um, within the uh, wind of opportunity we have to reduce carbon emissions by 50%, right? In the next, not even 10 years anymore, if we are to follow the IPC calendar. So we have a, we have a short term grave emergency. We need to reduce uh, emissions as, as fast as we can. Um, I don't expect everyone to join um, join either Marx or St. Francis or, or Ruskin in that uh, period of time. We're going to remain fragmented. Uh, but that's, that's not, uh, uh, not so bad, in my opinion. I think we can come together, despite being uh, many different political regimes, uh, this, despite espousing many different kinds of values, I think it's enough if we can come to a practical agreement to reduce emissions. So the short-term goal is to avert emergency through practical action. And uh, I don't see deeper cultural change happening in that short calendar. But uh, you have to remember that these planetary challenges are going to be, be with us for the rest of the history of mankind, right? We have to learn how to never burn coal and oil again, right? And we have to stand vigilant and, and watch over that. So it seems to me long-term, and I'm not sure when it might happen, but long-term, we have to make fossil fuels taboo, something we simply don't touch, right? And what a beautiful, uh, uh, application of Ruskin's own economy of limits to do that, right? To say, here's a form of abundance that actually leads to leads straight down to hell. We'll say no to that, um, to protect ourselves and also the world, right? So I think, of, I think of this in terms of two calendars. One is a political emergency where I don't expect cultural change uh, other than to come to a kind of sense of self-preservation on the part of these of many different regimes. If we can bring the Chinese on board, that'd be great, right? Um, but long term, I think um, we have to replace the current growth regime and, and the fossil fuel economy with something else. And there, I think cultural change is the only option and, and universal cultural change, right? Uh, very hard to say how that might actually turn out, right? 
But I would, you know, if we can just reduce emissions in the short term, we can buy ourselves some time to figure out how to do the, the deeper cultural change. That would be my, that's as hopeful as I'm going to get, Tyson. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. yeah. May I speak? Yes. Um, I was experiencing the sort of despair that I think we all uh, have tasted one day, some few couple of years ago, and went to um, a uh, social gathering uh, and happened to walk up the driveway with the same couple, uh, my wife and I, the same couple that had walked up that same driveway the year before for the Christmas party. And I expressed that despair uh, that, at that moment. Um, and uh, this chap was uh, much, much younger than I, uh, 30 years younger. And he said, no, 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 you have to read a book and you'll be uh, lifted uh, out of this to uh, a sense of hopefulness. And I'd like to share that uh, experience as well as the name, name the book. And while cultural change is something to hope for, the reality, in my opinion, having tried to school myself about some of these things since that reading, is lies in what one might characterize as techno technocratic optimism or technological optimism. And the book is called Abundance. Uh, the author is Peter Diamandis, and he is one of a triumvirate that runs the Singularity University in San Francisco, which includes the geniuses Ray Kurzweil and, uh, and um, what's his name, um, Martin Rothblatt. Uh, I recommend this book, I recommend Singularity University. The scientific advances potentially are so extraordinary as to be nearly incomprehensible in the context of these cultural and political, this political and cultural uh, reactionary, re uh, reactionary uh, situation, absolutely extraordinary. And we're on the verge of every kind of breakthrough. Power will be free. Uh, that will then free up uh, our, our dependency on all the fossil fuels and make everyone in a sense uh, able to uh, participate in some level of security and uh, equity. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, would you uh, put the title of that book in the chat yes. line for those, yeah, sure. those who haven't heard of it? Um, uh, yeah, that's of course a uh, um, one interpretation of all of this. I actually have a slide um, addressing this perspective. Um, in uh, in the Anthropocene literature, there's a group called uh, that calls itself um, eco modernists um, that you may have heard of. They're they're affiliated with a similar view. They're not quite as sanguine as your guys, um, but they basically see the Anthropocene crisis as a as potentially a moment of cultural flourishing that precisely the pressure brought to bear on us will unleash new kinds of technological cultural creativity um, i'm on board with that in part um, but i get a little skeptical about you know the uh, the kurtzweil argument about transcending humanity you know uh, uh, basically transforming ourselves into something inhuman in my view um I yeah that, i mean that that i'm not that's I that's, not my, that. yes. that's not my path um and i also think that the problem even if you are to uh, agree that we might have a wonderful energy revolution uh in in the next dec decade or so uh cold fusion or or what have you um the the problem with that energy revolution is that energy in itself is not sufficient to preserve the biosphere, right? No matter if, it, even if it were abundant, as E.O. Wilson puts it in Half Earth, I'll, I'll put that in the, in the chat as well. Um, this is, if we really are serious about avoiding a mass extinction, we have to set aside land, right? Biodiversity is land, land intensive and extensive. I'm tempted to say that it challenges the imagination to, to come up with a 
schema wherein land is a function, is a product of this extraordinary technological advance. Mm -hmm. I'm tempted to say that it challenges my imagination at least. I think that it is possible. I'm, I'm more optimistic about that result. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would agree with that too. If, if we start treating the land not simply as an inert passive resource, a standing reserve, for humanity to dispose of, but rather as an active partner in human creation. Oh, yeah. um, that's why I kept hinting again and again that in Ruskin's thought, I see not just human workers, but also nature working alongside uh, humans in making the world. I think that's phenomenally important. Yeah. Um, obviously it's not, we're not, humans and non-humans are not the same, right? I don't mean to be an animist about this and claim that, I, at least I don't have that spiritual belief that animals and plants have their own uh, human-like agency and intelligence. But I think uh, it may be possible at least to confer a sense of dignity in the work that non-human agents do. And that might include not just animate forces, but also inanimate forces. Consider um, the honeybee. Right, right. Without the honeybee, no food. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that's all that's always impressed me, in, in particularly about about Ruskin, not only his obviously the bigger picture of cultural change, and I think his 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 understanding in the storm cloud of the apocalyptic possibilities. So these bigger kind of forces at work. But also, also I think with this, his sense of, of uh, a re-education of the human person. Mm -hmm. Because I think Ruskin sees, even in the beginning of the enlightenment that you were talking about, uh, uh, the emergence of a wrong idea about the human person that emerges, of course, later on in capitalism. The, the notion that the Human, human life is driven by self-interest and competition, whereas Ruskin sees this the vision of the law of help, of all of, all of life in a in a inter interlocked, uh, in a in a fundamental set of connections, which of course is obvious to us on the on the realistic level. Hmm. So I I think Ruskin's notion of the the psychology of insatiability, the education of desire. The pulling out not only of a of a set of economic and social structures, but psychological structures, spiritual structures, if you will, that 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 the cultural change has to happen on this, on that fundamental level too, as personal and group decisions about the sufficient life that he talks about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I add one small vignette? We were at a fundraiser for a uh, World Conservation Institute, I think it's called. Um, <clears throat> the vice president was telling about a story about a gentleman who had come not only on one, but two, what they call sojourns to uh, a fragile and uh, a threatened environments, uh, uh, you know, uh, marshes and uh, all sorts of environments that are very fragile. And he came back after the second sojourn and said, well, uh, I'm going to instruct our company to stop idling trucks in our parking lots. Mm -hmm. It will save us millions of dollars. His name was uh, Rob Walton. It was Walmart. Walmart's on the path, actually, and that's a sign of some, some optimism, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question, Frederick? Um, wonderful to see you again, and thank you for a great paper. Um, I'm going to criticize Ruskin a little bit, even though I admire him inordinately. Mm -hmm. It seems to me at times that Ruskin addresses the middle classes. And even when he's addressing the working classes, he's addressing the middle classes. Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to tell the middle classes to restrain their desires to live sufficiently. It's another thing to say the same thing to the destitute. Um, what does Ruskin's solution for our situation have to say to the poor of the world, the poor who have often been lifted somewhat out of poverty by the very environmental degradation and burning of fossil fuels that um, he would deplore and we would all deplore. 
yeah, uh, good to see you, Rob, and, and thanks for that. Um, yeah, this is where we get to the to what I signaled as the as my own break with Ruskin, in a sense, right? Where I, I see Ruskin, at least at times, as a reactionary, speaking to the preservation of his favored tribe or race of a certain kind of peasant stock. Um, I mean, he doesn't turn his back on, on the poor of the cities entirely, right? Um, uh, but he seems far more enthusiastic about um, restoring dignity and virtue to the poor in the country rather than the city, right? He is, at least in the Brantwood period, I think his mind is really, it's almost as if it, he has abandoned the problems of urban life, um, perhaps because his mind no longer can cope with all the strains. I mean, there is, a, I think Tyson alluded to this earlier, there is a sense in which returning to the Lake District is, a, is, a, is building a wall between himself and some of the problems he can't solve. He is, he is, he's seeking mental uh, stability haunted by his own illnesses, his, his, his madness, and maybe also retreating because everything is accelerating around him and, and he has no solutions. He's horrified by the second industrial revolution. And he's horrified by the socialist uprising in Paris, right? Um, he's most, I mean, he, sometimes we think of him as a red, as a, as a, uh, as a, a Tory socialist uh, or a red Tory. Uh, that works only so far, I think. I, I, I see his Brantwood period as, as more closely aligned with a re reactionary ideal of refuge in the country, right? So that's one side of it. That's that's uh, Ruskin's side. Um, what are we to do about the future? Um, well, one one path that might alleviate poverty would be to follow the techno optimistic side that Stuart alluded to earlier, right? Um, I think at least as as long as that's fueled by fossil fuels, uh, we're, we're going to run into the paradox of Amitabh Ghosh, that development actually ends up undermining the welfare of the poor. Um, uh, Jason Hickel, uh, uh, an anthropologist uh, who is based, I think, at LSE in London, um, really a specialist uh, in uh, the anthropology of development, uh, has a book out called Less, I think it's called Less is More, um, which fleshes out this, this notion of convergence around a shared universal standard of sufficiency. Uh, I don't think there's a, any reference to Ruskin in there, um, but, but clearly the idea of sufficiency is, is uh, central to Hickel's notion of uh, post-growth flourishing, that um, there is a safe zone of development um, that we can reach in the name of development for the poor without transgressing the planetary boundaries. But that comes at a steep price because we can only create that space or preserve that space if the West, if the affluent countries agree uh, to slow down their growth and stabilize their economies, make them circular beforehand or in tandem with this process. And so that's the meaning of convergence for Hickel. Um, and it's interesting that he has relatively little to say about the politics of this, um, but is quite convinced that it wouldn't be that difficult to agree on in, in, in theory. <laughs> that uh, it, it rests on principles of justice and flourishing that um, will be of great appeal. The problem I think for Hickel is, how do you get the modern nation state um, on board with this? How do you get politicians and the military industrial complex, um, right? I mean, it's one thing to say that human, uh, that uh, Westerners have become addicted to fossil fuel and cornucopian ideology, uh, it's another thing to admit that states, um, states are addicted to growth. They're addicted to revenue to build up the military power, right? Um, so 
So yeah, it's a heck of a problem. Uh, you can't really solve the problem with, of poverty um, without solving the problem of degrowth in the state. Um, and I suppose achieving world peace on the end of the arms race. It's at that point that you won, you know, even though, as you said in your paper, Ruskin was was uninterested in politics, Ruskin was un uninterested to some extent in kind of geopolitical levels of discourse. Maybe the the gospel of sufficiency has to be applied to the states as well, mm -hmm. the, to, to wean them off, off from this, you know, not to the poor, uh, probably to the middle classes, um, but definitely to the states themselves against this, endless desire for growth and 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 you know ever great ever greater gdp and and so forth mm -hmm. yeah i think a, a really important part of what you brought up and just in the last phrase and then how that ties to you know what's going on with um in ruskin's work is this idea of creating sort of circular economies that can kind of maintain wealth whatever it is, wealth, resource, materialism, inside of a singular space, I think is the fundamental way in which we start to move states away from the current model that we're on of globalistic sort of imperialism that will allow the global South to stabilize and um, build an economy that's natural for themselves, but also alleviates the need for like rapid imperialism from the global North. Mm -hmm. And it stems from things like buy local campaigns, you know, reducing consumption, um, and then uh, continued effort to develop our renewable energy sources so that we have less of a demand globally from, you know, the Middle East on for our resources or Canada, even tar pits, et cetera. Um, and by doing so, we kind of create a, um, a homeostasis sort of in our society so for cultural change to begin to happen so i think like it's going to happen I'm, I'm i'm one of those optimistic folks in the room i guess and i think ruskin uh was pointing towards it and he like is so eloquent in the way in which he describes a sufficient life i think that that as the backdrop of you know as we move towards that lifestyle um will bring solace to a lot of people and make it easier for new cultural references to be built upon it like the music industry does, it builds upon itself. And one song sounds like another. Um, and I, I, I'm just optimistic that that's the case. And I think there are a lot of businesses, uh, my own included and, and others that I've heard of that are help fostering this sort of localization of, of economic uh, throughput. And sorry, Stuart, I know the Waltons are onto it, but I also think they destroyed our country in a lot of ways. Um, so, <laughs> Just putting that out there i'm not into walmart um but understands its value to the global poor and to the poor in america so, so um i don't know if that was a comment a question or if it was just a, a lead into something else but um yeah thank you so much for, for everything you said today and i i've just been wowed throughout the entire experience because i've heard you like i you, you're hedging each one of my questions as i was listening to today and i thought that that was just magnificent so thank you very much no, thanks, Andrew. Thanks so much. Um, I, I, I appreciate your comment. I, uh, one way to think about uh, this recentering around the local um, is to look at the new infrastructure of renewables. Um, you know, it, it, um, we don't know quite yet what happens when we, when we turn off the old system. Um, do we get, do we replace the national grid with another national grid? Um, or will energy supply become something very local um, and anchor this new sense of self-sufficiency that, that you and Ruskin are talking about? Um, um, I think against your optimistic po position, I'll, I'll just play devil's advocate for a moment. One fear I have is that uh, accelerating climate change uh, might lead to more conflicts around the world and um, in fact, um, force or provoke the, the uh, uh, military side of the state to dig in its heels um, and become more belligerent, not less. 
right? Um, and I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, it may be that a lot of this will be uh, down to the play of circumstance, to contingencies, um, who's in charge of a particular country at a crisis point, as we all know, may matter a great deal. Um, so I, I, I hesitate to, I don't want to go too far down the pessimistic path, Andrew. <laughs> I'll yeah. stay with you with it. Uh, I, I do think that um, a lot of people find the circular economy an intuitive concept, an appealing one, um, as, long as, um, as long as it's organized around the principle of equality, right? And then again, we, we come back to this problem of overcoming entrenched hierarchies and overcoming perhaps the nation state in the process. The uh, the very first episode, I really appreciate that. The really very first episode of Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist podcast, um, he covers the, the experience of Elizabeth Thomas, one of the famous painters of, of British history, and speaks a little bit about um, how progress happens via tokenism. So that creates a moral dilemma where when you, a problem comes up, like, oh, you're not progressive enough. It was like, you know, 40, 40 people were accepted into the Royal Academy of the Arts in Britain at the time. It was super prestigious. And uh, having a woman in, involved was, uh, was unacceptable, um, really, on all accounts. How would we manage this from, like, how do we run a party with a woman here? Uh, and how do, who walks her in? How does this happen? Uh, all the way up to what the appearance is and how that's just socially managed. And uh, the main takeaway was essentially that they didn't end up letting her in. Um, and, uh, but she almost did by two votes. So they looked incredibly progressive and they put her painting at the, you know, on the, on the main line of the, of the room, gallery two of, of the, the Royal Academy of Art. And, um, and so it made them look very progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened then afterwards was a series of, of uh, years where no women were involved included and so they were like well look how progressive we are we did all these things and what you were making me think there is essentially that if we can't uh, you know if a rise of right nationalism uh increases because of a need for refugees to leave flooded bangladesh um into uh you know all the way into europe or if you have north uh, north africans fleeing to the desertification of, of north africa to, to you know italy or spain um, and the rise of the right can't accept that, and stops the refugees, et cetera. Uh, and you have political uh, catastrophe because of that, because we can't manage that effectively. I think you will in like inevitably, even from the right, there'll have to be some level of a gift back. And that gift will be through auto technocraticism, if you will. And I think it has to be through renew renewable energy sharing um, between country states to help stabilize, even though that, and I think that's my darkest picture of how that ends up playing out. And it will be, you know, a lot of casualty along the way, but tokenism, I think, will, will step in and create at least a precedent um, to build upon. Thanks again, Andrew. Um, do we have time for one more comment? I think, Joseph, you have your hand up. I had a question. Yes, yes we do. Yeah. Uh, Frederick, again, thank you so much. Uh, I, like I said, I was looking forward to this um, all week. Uh, it's wonderful to be a part. Um, especially with respect to the idea of the need of growth and more. And I, I know far too much about and just as being a human being. Um, what, what came to my mind was, was also the growth of population uh, that seems to be happening. And I was wondering what you thought that Ruskin would, Ruskin's take on a sufficient life with respect to a population growth that seems to be uh, making all of this a little difficult in theory. Yeah. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, comment, uh, Joseph. Uh, I think actually Ruskin um, was comfortable with the idea of, of population growth. He was not a Malthusian. If anything, he was an anti-Malthusian. And so when he speaks of sufficiency, I think he imagines that there's more than enough for everyone, even for a very dense population in the countryside, if, uh, if we keep everybody outside consumer society um, and we live uh, modestly. Again, remember this conservative vision of his 
um, of um, each person living according to their station, right? Um, so I think that's a um, uh, that's probably Ruskin's view of things. Um, mm. If you're asking me um, uh, where I think population growth figures into this, I, my my answer is very simple: that um, uh, the Anthropocene is driven by consumption, right? By, by uh, consumption of a minority of the world's population. And we, we sometimes talk as if the species had caused the Anthropocene, but it's really, it's really the fossil fuel burning part of humanity that set the ball in motion, um, right? Now, population still matters in this regard though, because um, it matters how large a minority you're dealing with, right? So in that sense, demographic baselines for consumption are critical. It matters whether the United States has a population of 300 million or 30 million or 3 billion, right? You're gonna cause um, a lot more damage if the aggregate, if, if the average American um, is emitting carbon um, at that higher bound of say, you know, 300 million or 3 billion, you know? Um, so it's not exactly a Malthusian argument about, about pure population pressure and land, finite land and, and famine and so forth. It's a modified argument about, um, again, how insatiability and excessive consumption of the few um, and, and um, perhaps the very large minority of uh, fossil fuel burning humans um, cause problems for the rest. That's why, uh, by the way, that's why I use the term finitarian sometimes, because that indicates that creates a different umbrella category than Malthusian, right? Uh, Malthusian comes with a very specific set of criteria for its definition, again, to do with the finite supply of land and, and the, the problem of the food supply. Ruskin is an anti-Malthusian finitarian. He is not concerned with population growth, but he's very much interested in limits. As a fact, as a as a constraint on on uh, human flourishing, for all the reasons I've talked about earlier tonight. Frederick, thank you so much for a uh, a more than stimulating lecture and an even more stimulating discussion. Um, why don't we just? I'm going to end this, letting the old man have his final word with the uh, quote from Modern Painters Five. So the things to be desired for man in a healthy state are that he should not see dreams, but realities. That he should not destroy life, but save it. And that he should not be rich, but content. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, Gabe. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for this incredibly stimulating conversation. Um, please get in touch. Um, my, um, I'll put my email in the chat line. Great. I'd love to hear from you. I'll stay behind just a little bit if that's okay, Gabe. Um, of course. Everyone wants to say hello. Um, the rest of you have a, have a lovely evening and um, hope to hear from all of you at some point. Thanks again. Great. Just I have a couple of quick announcements. I always have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the next Ruskin event in our season is uh, follows quickly upon this one. It's next week. Uh, September 23rd, Thursday, which is our normal, our normal night for lectures, 5 p.m. Um, Melissa Leventon is going to give us a very entertaining and colorful uh, presentation on Victorian radicals and the cult of beauty. And uh, she's going to talk about the effect of Ruskin's objections, in particular about the barbarous women's fashions of his day and the effect that they had on women's health and the way that that was taken forward by the pre-Raphaelites in creating images of clothing that then uh, were, uh, were uh, influential in changing women's fashions towards the end of the, uh, for the better, at the, for the, uh, at the end of the 19th century. So fascinating presentation and very, very colorful and interesting. On October 7th, just to keep you in, move you into a little bit of October, um, 
the uh, Brown University historian Carol DeBoer Longworthy is giving a talk called Her Mother's Daughter, Neth Boyce's Los Angeles. Uh, Mary Boyce, Neth's mother, is the founder of the Ruskin Art Club. So this is a presentation on the, on the Boyce's, a very interesting family um, in late 19th century Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, the next generation, uh, uh, the colorful lives of the next generation uh, in pre-World War I Los Angeles. So a, a very entertaining presentation. She's a, uh, this is kind of her, her major concentration uh, is this period. So this will be very, uh, very interesting. Uh, other information, including membership uh, in the Ruskin Art Club, the history of the Ruskin Art Club, Ruskin resources galore, the Ruskin Art Club newsletter, which uh, contains, by the way, a short review by yours truly on, uh, on the Green Victorians, uh, and also our YouTube channel where this talk will uh, shortly be, be posted, along with dozens of other lectures and presentations from the recent past. So. When you access the channel, uh, please do subscribe, www.ruskinartclub.org. And that's all of my announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for all your help tonight. Thank you, Frederick, again. Wonderful. I think Trevor had a question. If Frederick's hanging out, oh, he's gone. I think. Yeah, no, Trevor, did you have a question for Frederick? Yeah, is he still on? I think he just popped off. Oh, he just popped off. Oh, too bad. No worries. Okay. That was great. Thanks for uh, thanks for holding that and uh, all the nice words at the end there. I appreciate it. Trevor, did I you get, did you get uh, Trevor? Did you get his email? You might be able to email him. Yeah, I did. And I'll, uh, I'll make sure to forward it to him. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Gabriel. Certainly. Okay. See you later. See you later. Thanks, Andrew. Eric.